Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are in the book of Romans, and we have been in Romans chapter 9. And we are looking this morning at Romans 9, 14 through 24. Paul has been speaking about the doctrine of unconditional election. And he has given examples of that from Isaac being chosen over uh, Ishmael and Jacob over Esau. In fact, he pointed out that before either were born, either Jacob or Esau, the twins were born, or had done good or bad, God chose Jacob over Esau. Now that raises questions in the minds of people. They feel that's not fair. And the choice should be ours. And so Paul deals with that issue now about the fairness of God. We begin reading in verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there, there is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, what does he, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and our time of study in it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Charles Spurgeon made a correct observation when he said of some people, a lot of people, that no doctrine makes them grind their teeth like the glorious doctrine of divine sovereignty. They want a God, he said, who must not be on a throne. He must do as his creatures tell him. But he said, I adore the God who says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. I agree. That's God Almighty, the God of Romans 9, the God of the Bible, the only God, who the psalmist says is in the heavens, he does whatever he pleases. I know this is a hard issue to accept for many people, and I'm sympathetic, but it's not hard to understand. Reading the chapter is enough. It requires little explanation. It's hard to accept for many people, but again, it's not hard to understand. He has mercy on whom he desires. He is the potter. We are his clay. That's Romans 9. It has a context. It is Paul's defense of God. It's a defense of his word. God had made promises to Israel of salvation, the promise of a kingdom, but Israel was in unbelief. They had rejected their king. They'd rejected the Messiah. And so the question is raised, what happened? 
Did God's Word fail? Paul answers that question by stating that the promises were never intended for every physical descendant of Abraham or even every ethnic Jew. Not all Israel is Israel, he has said. The promises of, e of the eternal spiritual blessings that God has given were given to the elect of Israel. Paul then demonstrates that from Scripture through God's choice of Isaac over Ishmael, his choice of Jacob over Esau. Salvation is determined by God, by God's distinguishing grace in election. That is what people object to. The idea that the choice is God's and not ours. That is what Paul now defends. God's right to choose. Anticipating the objections to God's sovereignty in our salvation, objections that Paul had heard numerous times. In fact, you see this all through the book of Romans. He raises an objection to something that he has said because there are objections that he knows we probably have. He knows that because of his experience in the synagogue debating with the Jews or in the marketplace debating with the Gentiles. And so he brings them in to Romans throughout to give the typical objection that people has, and he does that here. And he, he, he brings out two objections that people have. The first is, is God fair? And secondly, are we responsible? Because if it's true, they would say that God does decide human destinies apart from anything in the person. Well, that's not right. That's that's the complaint. It's not fair. It's not just. And if he does do that, if he determines our end from the beginning, then we can't, he can't blame us for rejecting him. Well, the first question about fairness in election is asked in verse 14. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? He answers with the typical emphatic denial, may it never be. The thought of injustice with God, Paul is saying, is intolerable. Paul begins with the belief in God's perfection, in His absolute righteousness. God is always right and cannot do wrong. And that's where we must begin. Because that's what the Bible teaches. If someone wants to discuss God with me or with you for that matter and wants to do it aside from the scriptures, let's not talk about the Bible, well then I have nothing to say. I don't know anything about God other than what the Bible reveals. Now Psalm 19 tells me that the heavens are declaring the glory of God so that's natural revelation and I know enough by looking at the heavens and looking at nature that there is a God but I know nothing about him other than that he exists and that he's powerful. But if one wants to talk about the character of God, the person and the work of God, and the promises of God, we have to rely upon the scriptures and the scriptures alone. It's our authority and it is true. God is perfect. That's what the Bible reveals. He cannot be unrighteous. That is where Paul begins in his argument. And he uses scripture to uphold his denial now, his statement, may it never be that God is unjust. Everything he does in this chapter, by the way, to defend the integrity of God and the promises of God and the work of God is based on scripture. He develops it all in that way. And so he now defends and upholds this denial that God is unjust by explaining God's actions from scripture when he quotes in verse 15, Exodus 33, verse 19. For he, that is God, says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Paul's defense of God's choice of, of some in election and his rejection of others is mercy. That's his defense. In other words, the issue in salvation is not one of fairness at all. It's about kindness. 
It's about grace. When a person gives a dollar to a beggar, he isn't considered unjust for giving money to one person and not giving it to another. And the reason is because giving gifts is not like paying debts or taxes. A person may give to one person and not give to another without injustice at all because it, it, it's not something that's owed to them. Charity is a matter of kindness. But God's mercy is not merely a matter of kindness. It is undeserved kindness. It is given to those who deserve judgment. God's statement to Moses about having mercy upon whom he wills was given after the incident of the golden calf. When Israel rejected God, they engaged in idolatry and gross immorality. They committed apostasy. They turned from the Lord. If justice were the issue, then God would have destroyed the nation. And that's true of every one of us. That's true of everyone without exception. Now, Paul has clearly demonstrated that in the early chapters of this book, in chapters 1 through 3, specifically verses 18 through 20, and then actually in verse 23 as well, he made it very clear that we are guilty. There is none righteous, he said. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is mankind. We are all like Israel worshiping the golden calf. We deserve wrath, not mercy. We deserve judgment, not salvation. I think one of the great impediments to understanding the Word of God, and I say that generally, the Word of God, but certainly specifically these doctrines that we're looking at now, the doctrines of predestination and, and the doctrines of election, one of the great impediments to understanding the sovereignty of God is the false assumption that we deserve goodness from God. Now we know we're bad sometimes. We've all done something wrong. We've done, there are peccadilloes in our life and we, we all confess that. We're, we're only human, right? And so we make mistakes. But we're not as bad as that guy or that person. And I overlook things. Surely God will overlook my little failures. Well, that's not the, the, the way the scriptures present human nature and the condition of each and every one of us. No, we, we fall short. We want to say we merit something. Well, what we merit is wrath. We lost any favorable standing with God when we fell in Adam. We are guilty. Mercy to anyone is undeserved and given only because God graciously wills to give it. It is His sovereign and free act. And He has a right to give it to whomever He desires and withhold it if He desires. How can we argue with that? We are absolutely at God's mercy. Paul indicates that in verse 16 where he concludes it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs but on God who has mercy. That's a pretty absolute statement, isn't it? And with that statement, Paul sweeps away any pretense man might have of free will, meaning man's ability to independently uh, choose what he does, act independently of God's will, and do things of his own volition. Now, I'm not saying, and I want you to know this, that man doesn't act freely. And man doesn't understand things, and man doesn't choose and do things freely. He certainly does. But he cannot choose God independently of God. He cannot choose him of his own, as I said, volition. Now people will argue fervently for that, but Paul is plain. He's very clear here. It is not man's will. It's not his choice that determines God's mercy. And it's not man's most earnest efforts at seeking God, his running, his exertion. Mercy is all of God. How else could it be? Knowing our condition. Knowing our sinful condition. We are all born into the world fallen, fallen. 
guilty, spiritually dead. Paul makes that very clear in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. You were, dead, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, but God, being rich in mercy, delivered us. Oh, we saw that in, in our studies in Romans earlier. In Romans chapter 8, the very beginning of the chapter, he speaks of the natural man, the man who's governed by the flesh, and he says he's hostile toward God. He cannot please God. That's us. That's all of us naturally. We are hostile toward God. We are bent against Him. That is man by nature. That is uh, something we must understand, as I said, in order for us to, to uh, understand the things of God and understand His mercy. As I say, how else could it be? If this is the condition of man, how else could it be that it is determined by God and not us? No one has insight or ability, even the natural desire to move to God apart from His mercy. That's the only reason anyone is able to do so. And the reason that multitudes, in fact, do come to the Lord, who do trust in Him, it's because of God's mercy. Help for the helpless. And God gives an abundance of it. He gives life, He gives ability, He gives faith. Willing and running are not illusions. We do will. We do run. We do seek. And a believer does truly believe he or she comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. But people do seek and believe as a result of mercy. It's not our seeking that causes mercy. It's mercy that causes us to seek. The real problem people have who insist that they have the ability to choose God is the one that Anselm, the medieval theologian, cited in his book, Why God Became Man, which he debates another individual. And he says to this individual that his problem is this, that he has not considered how great his sin is. And that is the problem that so many people have. We've not really considered how great our sin is, how great our guilt is. Our sin is deadly. So God's choice of some and not others is not a matter of justice, but mercy, compassion. And it's His divine right. God is sovereign in election. And likewise, God is sovereign in rejection. Paul demonstrates that in the next verses where he moves from election to reprobation. This is the other side of predestination. Election is the positive side. Reprobation is the negative side. It's about God's sovereign rejection of people for salvation. Hardening them. That's the way Paul puts it. It is admittedly a difficult doctrine and has brought harsh criticism from people outside of the church, but also people inside the church, those who grind their teeth over the doctrine of God's sovereignty. Edward Gibbon, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, published in 1776, said of this doctrine that it made God a cruel and capricious tyrant. Erasmus, 250 years earlier, the great scholar of the end of the Renaissance and the Reformation, argued that it made God unjust. Even John Wesley referred to the horrible decree of predestination. Reprobation may be unpleasant, but it is the logical counterpart of election. If God has chosen some and not all, then it necessarily follows that He has rejected others. Obviously, He chose not to choose them. So it is, it is a logical deduction from the doctrine of election, which is clearly presented in the Word of God. But our understanding of God is not determined by logic. It's not determined by human reason. And I'm not denigrating logic. It's important. It's necessary if we're going to understand the Bible. We must be logical because the Bible is completely logical. 
But our understanding of these things is not determined by human reason. We know these things, again, as I said earlier, by revelation. So, the question is, what's the revelation? What do the scriptures say? And the answer is, they teach this doctrine of reprobation. I'll give you just one example outside of our passage, and then we see a number right here. Two of them I'll give you. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 4, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. And what do we read here in our passage? In verse 18, He has mercy on whom He desires, and He hardens whom He desires. Verse 22, He is patient with vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And God gave a, a specific example of that in history in the way that He dealt with the king of Egypt. In verse 17, Paul quotes from Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. For the Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. The purpose of this example is to show that God sovereignly reprobates. He sovereignly rejects just as He sovereignly elects. And in both, He is glorified because in His judgment, His power is made known just as His mercy is made known in His salvation. He revealed His mercy in saving a man like Moses who was a murderer, and he revealed his power in judging a man like Pharaoh. And that was God's purpose for the king of Egypt. That's what he told Moses and Aaron to say to Pharaoh when they went before him to demand that he let Israel leave Egypt. Pharaoh was the most powerful man in the world at that day. He was worshipped as a god. And the Lord said to him, I raised you up. Now that's what, uh, not what an Egyptian God expected to hear from the God of Hebrew slaves. Because the Lord was declaring that Pharaoh was his creation. He put him on the throne of Egypt and he put him there for his own purpose. Now that purpose was to demonstrate God's power in him. And in that way, give a wide proclamation to God's name and reveal Himself as the, the true God throughout the whole earth. That happened through the plagues that God brought on Egypt, which brought about Israel's deliverance and exodus through the Red Sea. And each plague occurred because Pharaoh's heart was hardened against, the, against God and resisted the Lord's demand that He let His people go. Pharaoh resisted. But it was all according to God's purpose. That's what the Lord says. Throughout the book of Exodus we read that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now we also read that Pharaoh hardened his own heart, but only a few times. The large majority of texts, the verses that deal with this, that state this, state that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the first reference to that is in Exodus chapter 4 verse 21. And it's to God hardening Pharaoh, not Pharaoh hardening himself. When the Lord sent Moses back to Egypt to begin his ministry, he told him to perform miracles before Pharaoh. That will show Pharaoh the, the great authority with which you speak and, and the greatness of the God for whom you speak. But he said, I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. So Pharaoh resisted God. His resistance was answered with plagues, ten plagues that became increasingly greater, showing His power and revealing Him to be the true God. In fact, it's stated there that He, that he, he did these against the gods of Egypt. And all of those plagues uh, correspond to a God of Egypt. And He demonstrates in that way that He is the true God and certainly demonstrated that Pharaoh had no power over this God. 
when he finally destroyed the Egyptian army in the Red Sea and saved his people from slavery, his name spread throughout the earth and he was glorified as the mighty God. So there was a good end to the severe side of God's sovereignty. But Paul's point is that God is just as sovereign in rejection as he is in election. And he is righteous. He is right. He is just in all his actions. That's Paul's conclusion in verse 18. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. God is sovereign in the matter of who is saved and who is not. It's not based on us. It's based on God's will. He has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. Now, that does not mean that God hardens hearts arbitrarily, randomly, and makes good men sin against their will. It's not as though Pharaoh was this kindly king sitting on a throne wanting to know about God, and God hardened his heart. There are differences between God's severity and his mercy. God has mercy on sinners who are undeserving. He intervenes in their lives. He intervened in your life to give you faith, to want Him. He awakens in the spiritually dead a desire for Him, a, an interest in Him. He brings them to faith. That's 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love because He first loved us. If you're a believer, you love the Lord. Why do you love the Lord? While other people don't, because He loved you first and brought you to Himself. Those who are hardened don't love God, have no interest in Him. Paul's made that clear in the early chapters of the book. No one seeks after Him. No one does good. No one cares about Him. They're hostile toward Him. They don't please God. They don't want to please God. They cannot please God. These are the things that Paul has said. Those are the people that are hardened. That is Pharaoh who was hardened. God doesn't make them disbelieve. They already are, are in disbelief. They are, already are unbelievers in rebellion against Him. Pharaoh was a wicked man. God hardened his heart in his rebellion. He strengthened his will in his resistance to God so that Pharaoh freely chose to resist to his own destruction. There's no injustice in that. In fact, because of sin, everyone deserves to be hardened fully and rejected eternally. It is mercy that prevents that and mercy that saves. But God was not on, under obligation to save Pharaoh as He saved Israel. And he was not unjust in choosing Pharaoh to be the object of his wrath. He was already the object of his wrath. And he was not unjust in doing that and choosing to demonstrate in Pharaoh his great power. And as Paul shows, he deals with people differently, showing mercy to some and hardening others, all according to his sovereign will, which is uninfluenced by us. Now that's the chief point in verses 17 and 18. He is free to choose some and reject others. And in both he makes known his glory in the display of his attributes of power and his attributes of grace. What we learn from this is that we are completely dependent upon him for everything and certainly completely dependent upon him for salvation. It is not our doing. It is His alone. People don't like to hear that. That God is sovereign over human affairs and, and human destinies. It, it goes against their, their common idea of human freedom and fairness. Uh, the objection is, uh, if, if I don't have a free will and God is absolutely sovereign, determining the end from the beginning, then I can't be held responsible for not believing in Him. I'm I'm doing what He decreed. Uh, and, and, and if that is true, that, that He does that, 
It's not fair. Well, this is the common objection, maybe one that, uh, that even you have been thinking as we've been going through this. It's, uh, it's the very one that Paul raises and answers in verses 19 through 24. You will say to me then, he knows what people are thinking, you will say to me then, why does he find fault who resists his will? Pharaoh may have disobeyed God's commands, God's revealed will, but he did fulfill God's secret purpose, did he not? So how can he be faulted for that? Now that is the, the natural question that arises from Paul's teaching here. And it's not wrong to ask this question in an attempt to understand God's ways and in an attempt to understand God's instruction here. But a challenge to God's sovereignty and righteousness, uh, saying that, that God does not have the right to do that is not acceptable. And that's the real nature of the question here. It's not an object, it, it is an objection to all that Paul has said and what he is teaching. And Paul answers in a way that is enlightening, not only from what he says, but also from what he does not say. Verse 20, on the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why? did you make me like this, will it? Of course not. The question is rhetorical. It is really a rebuke intended to give perspective that is similar to that given in Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 and 9 where God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. His thoughts are infinitely higher than ours and His ways are past finding out. The study of God requires humility. It requires a study of God's Word, and it requires humility if it's to be fruitful at all. We are to submit to God's revelation of Himself, and that's the point. But Paul doesn't resolve the tension here between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. He holds to both. Uh, more significantly, Paul doesn't qualify anything that he has said. If the objection was a misinterpretation of what Paul was teaching about God's sovereignty over man's destiny, if, if Paul wasn't saying God determines it, we really determine our own destiny, then we would expect him to have corrected that. He did that earlier. For example, in chapter 6 when he was teaching on free grace and that was interpreted, misinterpreted as antinomianism where, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. Well, okay, Paul, then if that's the case, then let's sin that grace might increase. And Paul says, may it never be. No, you've misunderstood everything. How can we, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? He corrected that mis interpretation. But he doesn't do that here. He doesn't answer in that way here because he was teaching the very thing that the person objected to. He was teaching and is teaching here that God determines destinies. But it's not so much the critic's error, Paul corrects, as his attitude, which was one of rebellion. Paul objects to that. Who are you, O man? Who do you think you are, a mere mortal, to object to the Almighty God and what He does? And then he uses the illustration of the potter and the clay to reinforce even more his teaching on the absoluteness of God's sovereignty. Verse 21, or does, it, does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? Again, like verse 20, the question, does not the potter have a right over the clay, is rhetorical. It, ex it expects a yes answer. Obviously, he or she, the potter, does have authority over the clay. And just as the potter has the right to use his power to make clay display his skill, so too God has the right to reveal himself himself 
the way in the way he shapes humanity to bring out his glory. This is a, a, a common illustration in the Old Testament, that of the, the potter and the clay to illustrate God's relationship with, with man, with humanity, and it reveals so much about him. Isaiah, for example, and Jeremiah use this image of the potter and the clay. The uh, potter's house was a familiar part of village life in the Orient, so uh, it's a useful picture of the Creator. It, uh, it's even in Omar Khayyam's Rubiat. He spoke of the potter and the pot, a very common picture throughout that part of the world. But it's especially useful in showing the great gulf that exists between God and man. We are made of the same stuff, of, of, uh, same stuff as pots are made of, just clay, mere dust. We are creatures, not the Creator. So the very idea of challenging God, uh, of us putting Him on trial, is as absurd as a pot cross-examining the potter over his right to make his clay in the form and for the purpose that he chooses. And as Paul explains in the next verses, God displays the full range of His glory in those destined to inherit salvation and those destined for wrath. What if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And He did so to make known the riches of His glory upon vessels of mercy, which He prepared beforehand for glory. Two things to notice. First, God is patient with the human race. It is fallen and sinful, but He endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Pharaoh's the best example of that. God could have destroyed him immediately, but instead He gave him many opportunities to repent. Ten opportunities with the ten plagues. Few have had such opportunities as Pharaoh did, but he was unwilling. And, and he is an example of all such people. So they're all without excuse. But secondly, God's patience toward the vessels of wrath is for the sake of the vessels of mercy. He could have swept away the human race after the fall, but he didn't. He could have swept away the human race in the great flood, but He didn't. He saved a remnant. He could have swept away Israel and the whole hope of, of salvation, but He didn't. He has endured this rebellious race and from it made vessels prepared for glory and to witness His glory. And that is the great end of all things, the purpose of everything the glory of God. That's something we need to understand. We need not only to understand our lack of merit and our guilt, but we need to understand the great purpose of all things, and that is the glory of God. And He saved us so that we could see it and we could participate in it. We could display His full glory because He's going to make us glorious with that glory that is His. God must reveal His justice as well as His mercy in order for us to understand His glory and to appreciate it. He reveals both in the whole human race, mercy in those who are saved and justice in those who are lost. God's sovereign, but not, as some have said, a tyrant. Isaiah who says that God's will cannot be frustrated, that His hand cannot be turned back, also says that His hands are open all day long to a rebellious people. He is patient with sinners, but His patience runs out. His wrath will break on the unbelieving like a storm, like the wind as 
David put it in Psalm 1, that drives away the chaff. So the wise response is to submit. Don't resist, submit. That's Psalm 2. That's the exhortation of the second Psalm. Kiss the son, the psalmist said. Now that's said to the rebel. It's said to the unbeliever. Don't resist, it's foolish. Kiss the son. And we have an example of that from Rahab the harlot. I'll go back to Joshua chapter 2 where she gives testimony of the very things that Paul talks about here and that God said before Pharaoh. They heard the, the, what had taken place in Egypt and what had taken place on the east side of the Jordan River after God had brought them out of the desert for after tw- 40 years of wandering and they began to learn again of these great conquests. But she says to those spies that, uh, that she helped in uh, Joshua chapter 2, She said, now before, the the text says, now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what he did to the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, who you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in us any any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now that is a person who you would think would be unlikely to come to a saving knowledge of God. But she did. She understood what had taken place. She feared. She realized this is God and resistance to him is futile. And so Rahab the harlot believed. She kissed the son. That should be the response of every unbeliever. This is the God who is. And we cannot resist him. So submit to him. But this is true for Christians too. For those who grind their teeth over God's sovereignty. The Bible clearly teaches it. All of Romans 9 is based on scripture. As I said at the beginning, reading it is really all that's necessary. So all objections to predestination, to God's sovereignty over mankind's salvation and eternal destiny, all those objections are empty. Martin Luther had one of the best responses to those objections. He said, let God be God. He will be. You can't change that. He is the God of Romans 9. And those who submit to his revelation find peace. He is sovereign and in control. He he is working out his will for a good and glorious purpose. Only the God of Romans 9 can guarantee that. And that's the guarantee we have. And while there is severity to his sovereignty, his power and will are completely just and the means of displaying his undeserved mercy. It is his prerogative, his right as God to choose some in Israel for blessing and not others. And we Gentiles who were chosen by God and brought to Christ should be deeply humbled by his undeserved mercy and our complete dependence upon him for everything. It alone has given us a future of enjoying God's glory and radiating it forever. And that's what we should be doing. We should be doing that now. We should be living now to His glory, showing ourselves as vessels of mercy. Everyone will bring glory to God, actively or passively, willingly or unwillingly, either in heaven or in hell. But all will glorify God. How will you glorify him? Today is the day of his patience. He is calling out his elect as vessels of mercy. If you desire to be that, then believe in Jesus Christ. 
He receives and saves all who do. May God help you to do that. And help all of us rejoice in the greatness of our God.